I want to introduce you to the home brewery, homebrewery.naturalcrit.com. It's basically a tool set that allows you to format your document, if you're creating a D&D homebrew, into how it would be formatted in a Wizards of the Coast book in theory. This looks a lot harder than it is to use. Ghostfire Gaming does not use the home brewery for its books at all. This is a great tool for you to use if you don't have the resources of Ghostfire Gaming. Let us start a new document. The thing to remember here is that this page over here, this nice looking kind of parchmenty page over here, is not directly editable. This on the left, this kind of code page, is editable. So the first thing I'm going to do to create this stat block is I come up here to PHB, which gives kind of the formats for different things that might appear in a D&D book. So if I click spell list, it functionally kind of looks like the spell list from the player's handbook. If I click spell, it does all the formatting for a spell spell that appears in the player's handbook. And I just have to come over here and I'm like, no, my spell would be a bonus action instead of a full action. But it's only got a range of 30 feet, you know. It's pretty intuitive. You just have to fill in the fields once you've pulled up the kind of template that you want to use. And then once you've used the template two or three times, you kind of get an idea of what the different kind of bits of code are doing in the template. I'm going to pull up a monster stat block. Let's go a wide monster stat block. I click that. Bam! Wide monster stat block. The fields are pre-filled and they're pre-filled with a bit of a sense of humor. I'm going to make a creature called a Chort. If you've got your Witcher watch ready, you'll know where I'm pulling this from. Chort is this demonic type creature, but it has an appearance from what I could tell of kind of like a goat-legged, horned, roughly humanoid individual. I think it's where we get a lot of these concepts of Satan being associated with goats and rams and things like that. So you can see how that kind of led to the chorts that we see in The Witcher. I like those monsters because they feel demonic, but they also feel very earthy in a way. It's almost like a somewhere between a fiend and a fey creature. And that's sort of what I want to create here. Up the top, you can see I've already filled in short, but these two hashes up in the top corner denote that this is a title. So if I get rid of those, you'll see that short disappears as a big title on the right-hand side. If I just put in one, it gives me a big C for some reason, I assume that is. Two hashtags is what we want, but I can also go three to make it a smaller title, or four to an even smaller title, and five for an even smaller, you know. So that's how you control how big a title is in the home brewery. The other helpful thing about the home brewery is that it costs copies the language and layout of the monster manual pretty closely as well, even down to the punctuation, which I think is important. So you can see that gargantuan, the size, always comes first, and it is always capitalized. And I think my chort should be large. And then the creature type always comes second, but it is never capitalized. So the chort, I'm going to make it a fiend because I've, I have an idea of the sort of creature I want this to be. Let's say lawful evil. I want some law for the chort. So I'm going to hit enter a few times above in the code. You'll note as I hit enter to create some space up the top here, the stat block on the right hand side is not moving. So you need semicolons on any space that you are going to create more room on. Creating some room for myself, I want to create a new title, chort adding those hashtags on the left-hand side. And I'm going to say, a chort is a lesser demon of Malachia, the Archdemon of Pride in Grim Hollow. The semicolons on the left here, it's actually creating two columns uh, on the left and the right because it creates two columns automatically. And so that's why I needed to add in a few extra uh, semicolons to get the stat block to move further down. They live in the woods near settlements and offer dark bargains to those who wander nearby. Cool. The armor class of the short, I'm not quite sure. I'm gonna say 14 at the moment, but I want this thing to be able to make bargains. So I'm gonna say the, the CR for this at the moment will be nine. I'm not quite sure what the XP for that is off the top of my head, but I do like to fill that in. So in terms of its health, you know what? Let's go find out. Looking at other monster stat blocks that are not dissimilar to the sort of stat block you wanna make, it can help you get started. It can give you the basic structure of what you want to make. I'm just going to use the system reference document as we 
are able to thankfully do these days. This is an excellent document. If you've never seen it before, if you've heard the words OGL and SRD over the last couple of months, this is a reprint of a lot of what's in the player's handbook. You are allowed to, as far as I'm aware, basically copy this language into any fifth edition product that you are making so that it sits within the same rule set as fifth edition rules. The intention is that you can reference these abilities if you want to. Particularly, if I scroll right down, things like magic items, which I've conveniently just come into, or spells. The thing to note though is you need to use the SRD version. You cannot use what's in the Monster Manual, the Dungeon Master's Guide, or the Player's Handbook, because there may be differences. I want to scroll down and find Devil. So I've got Barbed Devil, Bearded Devil, Bone Devil. The thing you'll note is not in here is the flavor text for each of these devils. I'm not allowed to copy that flavor text wholesale across into an adventure that I'm writing, but I am allowed to copy the rules if I want to feature a Barbed Devil or a Bearded Devil. You don't need to worry about the SID so much. You could just copy it from D&D Beyond if you're not planning to publish it specifically. But if you do want to publish it, you should use the SID instead. So basically what this is telling me is, all right, 14, maybe that's a bit low. So I'm going to increase that. I'm going to say, I still don't think it should have like massive CR or AC, sorry, I should say, but I am going to increase that and say that it is natural armor because that kind of conforms with the devils that are already provided within the uh, monster manual. There is the rules that are in the DMG for creating quick monster stats, which give guide on CR, that sort of thing. I don't love using that because I find it confusing. But generally what I'll do is I'll create a monster. If I'm still not sure what the CR is, I will go and use that kind of after the fact, I don't think Wizards of the Coast designers at the time, back in 2014, used the method that's in the DMG for creating monster stat blocks. If it's a method that works for you, I, I, I fully encourage it. I'm going to give it some resistances, I think, being a devil. So I'm going to pitch its hit points low at the moment. And I think it's movement speed. I'm going to start at 30 feet. I just want to know what the movement speed of a minotaur is. Is there 40 feet? I reckon this thing's gonna have 40 feet as well because I'm kind of, like I said, I kind of see it as like a goat-like minotaur creature. I think it's gonna have a pretty big strength. What's a minotaur's strength is 18. Yeah, okay, I think it'll probably have like an 18. I think it's dex will be much lower, probably a 12. I think it's con actually is gonna be pretty all right. It's intelligence I'm going to make quite high. It's wisdom, 11 plus, yeah, you can see, the idea is that it is physically strong, but its main weapon is its mind and its charisma and its ability to kind of trick mortals into contracts. Oh no, okay, actually a CR9 monster does kind of have pretty good stats across the board. All right, let's go back in and, and play with these a bit more. I still think its dex is going to be pretty low. Maybe we'll pitch that at a 14 instead, so it sort of sits around its con. Now that we have a con for this thing, that's when we can start to look at what its health should be, because health is always triggered off of constitution. I am again going to lean on my bone devil. It's got 15 D10s for its health. During the stream, I tried to explain how to accurately calculate a monster's hit point maximum based on their hit dice and their constitution modifier, the way that it's actually done. But in speaking with the chat, we discovered that my reverse engineered way of calculating monster's health while accurate was kind of mathematically the long way around and also really hard to explain. So here's the better version that we landed upon. The choice Short's final health will be an average roll of its total hit dice plus its constitution modifier times the number of hit dice that the monster has. I've given the Chort 15d10 as its hit dice and its con modifier is plus two. Just like a player character adds their con mod each time to their hit point maximum when it increases at a level up, monsters add their con mod to their HP max for each hit dice they have as well. So in the Chort's case, its con mod modifier is 2 times its 15 hit dice equals 30. And that's the easy part. To work out the average roll of the hit dice, take the number that's half the highest number on the hit dice you're using. So for the Chorts D10, that number is five. If its hit dice was a D8, that number would be four. And if its hit dice was a D12, that number would be six. You get the idea. Add 0.5 
to that number. So 5.5 for a D10, or it would be 4.5 if the hit dice was a D8 and so forth. And then times that number by the amount of hit dice the monster has. So the Chort has 15 times 5.5 is 82.5. You're going to always round down that result if it's a decimal. In this case, rounding down to 82. We'll add the 30 hit points that the Chort gets from its con mod. So the monster's final hit point maximum is 112. Hope that made sense. Let me demonstrate a bit more about the home brewery, right? Because the next thing that usually comes up is saving throws in a monster stat block. As you can see with Home Brewery, as I type this in, you can see it changing in the formatted side on the right hand side. As you can see, there's still a little bit of space between saving throws and condition immunities. So you just space out and you put in your little semicolons and that will fix that right up. Those semicolons can go, I'm pretty sure, literally anywhere. I actually haven't figured out its proficiency bonus yet. I'm going to go to sources, the monster manual. Uh, proficiency bonus, that's what I was looking for by challenge rating, that's exactly what I was looking for. Plus four is what this thing's going to have as its proficiency bonus. So its charisma saving throw is going to be uh, plus seven because it's CR nine for the time being. That proficiency bonus might change. I'm going to be honest, I can't see it getting lower because if it goes down a proficiency, uh, goes down a CR, it's going to lose a point of proficiency bonus. So unless I think this thing's really a bit overpowered by the time I'm done with it, I can't see myself lowering its uh, challenge rating at this point. I'm pitching it as a CR nine, CR 10 monster now. What other saving throw should it have? Let's go with intelligence which at saving throw would be plus six and the reason I'm choosing that is because this thing kind of strikes me as a bit of a wizard or a warlock maybe more so what I'm gonna do is come down into its kind of features and put dark bargain as a feature that it can have this is just roughly writing it I'm not formatting it properly a creature can enter a bargain with the choice to gain some sort of benefit. Maybe the chalk can give like dark, it's almost like a magic item or like a, a lesser blessing to a, to a character. But as a result, the character has like disadvantage on attacks against the chort if they decided to try to get out of the bargain or something. Bargain chort gains some sort of benefit. They suffer a debuff against the chort. There's so many charm effects that I think this thing should be resistant to, unless I just make it immune to being charmed. But then that also feels like a bit of a cheat. I come back here to my SRD just to quickly check. Condition immunity is Barb Devil. Immune to being poisoned for the most part, the devils seem to be. I, I don't think this thing needs a charm immunity. So maybe a wisdom saving throw is enough to kind of like, it's, it's hard to charm it. It's not easy. Skills. Uh, and you can see, as I'm playing with the formatting here on the left, nothing's really happening with the formatting on the right because I haven't changed where these semicolons go. You don't need to put these spaces in, but I just like to because, again, it makes it look nicer on the left for my thinking. Um, I think this thing's definitely going to have deception. These are capitalized as well. Deception is going to be plus seven. I think it's going to have also persuasion. This thing's going to have a resistance to fire damage. I want this to be like an old school demon slash devil from 5e like you read about. Demon with an A because we're creating a Grim Hollow monster and it's not a devil specifically speaking because Grim Hollow doesn't make that differentiation between demons and devils like the Forgotten Realms does. If you were to incorporate this into a campaign that's in the Forgotten Realms this would most likely be a devil. And then it should have and these are always in alphabetical order bludgeoning, kissing and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. And I almost forgot my semicolon. That's right, or my colon, uh, whatever. Whichever one that one is. The one with the comma at the bottom. That's always important when talking about the mundane damage types. Dark vision, 60 feet, passive perception. Again, this can be literally calculated, will be 11. You can also see there's auto formatting happening over here in the home brewery, just because this has gone onto the second line, but there's a gap that's been left there on the right hand side, which is typical of stat blocks as published in adventures. There's no gap over here. I didn't need to put in any special formatting, so I like that again. Languages. <sighs> the reason I sigh is because I'm wondering what languages exist in Grim Hollow. Uh, uh.
Infernal and two. Okay, so Infernal is what we've gone with. Infernal and three other languages. Because this thing is intelligent. CR9, I don't know what the XP is off the top of my head. Uh, I could actually go back to 5,000 XP. I just want to highlight the, the kind of last few features of the, the home brewery for creating your own stat blocks. These last few areas here, which lays out, as you can see on the right hand side, the features and then the actions. And then you can add fields for bonus actions and reactions and legendary actions if you want to do that as well. The basic way the formatting is working, again, it's really, really easy. These underscores here, if I hit underscore, underscore, they're what are creating the red lines on the right hand side over here. And then when you want to mark out an ability, it is three stars on either side of the ability name. Important for ability name or feature names, whatever you want to call them, always capitalized, always bolded and italicized, and always have just a full stop at the end of them, not a semicolon or a colon or something like that. Okay, so basically what I want this thing, because like I said, it's a big goat-headed or ram-headed minotaur-like creature, but I don't think it should be able to speak with its mouth because then that's going to give it a bit of a Mr. Ed appearance, you know? If the adventuring party are in the wilderness and it's dark and the sun is setting, you know, sending red light through the trees and there's rustling and a big shape emerges out of the trees and says, hey, what you doing? their party out of its long snout that's just going to kill the atmosphere so i think the way this thing communicates is through huffs and kind of snorts from its mouth you know it's angry almost bullheaded uh kind of mouth but it communicates telepathically and can kind of learn actually this is not dissimilar to an aboleth feature. Oh, is the Aboleth in the SRD? Please be in the SRD. Yes, the Aboleth is in the SRD. <laughs> All right. So I think this probing telepathy feature is maybe something that we want to um, be inspired by. It learns the creature's greatest desires so that this thing can learn to tempt people. Maybe we we create some kind of um, a saving throw associated with this. Hopefully that doesn't just make the party instantly hostile towards it. Maybe the reason the Aboleth telepathy doesn't have a saving throw associated with it is because as soon as you ask a party member to make a saving throw, they might become a little more hostile to the creature than they might otherwise. I'm just going to write it in as probing telepathy for now. We might change the name of it later to something a little bit more original. I was explaining before the formatting. Yes, you have the, the three stars on either side. The other part that's important to this is the semicolons or the colons. As you can see, as I delete that colon but keep the space, all the abilities start to stack up on one e uh, on each other and start to kind of get squished together. Need to make sure, and you won't forget because you'll notice it if you get it wrong, these, sem uh, these colons or semicolons, whichever one they are, are between each of the features to keep them appropriately spaced out. I'm just going to delete these other pre-filled abilities here. Dark Bargain, Probing Telepathy, Spell Casting. I think I want to give it one more charge. Oh, actually, I want two more. What do I want to call this? I'm going to just call it uh, Distortion. In The Witcher, Chorts have... Or maybe it's only fiends that have this, but they're very related creatures, so I could be mixing this up. But basically, they have a third eye in the center of their head that opens up and uh, I think in the game it kind of blinds you that you also kind of lose control of Geralt for a few moments. And the only way to avoid it is to like not be looking at it when you see its uh, third eye open up. Or I think you can th maybe throw a bomb at it. I really like it because I feel like it is something that feels very otherworldly about the Chort or the Fiend in The Witcher. It makes it feel more than just a big angry bull that charges at you and makes it feel weird as in W-I-R-D uh, in a way. I want this creature to have something kind of similar like an eye ability where it can just make the world turn upside down the party's vision isn't correcting itself it's just they're, they're seeing the world upside down now even though they're not upside down themselves so now they're running into trees and you know maybe it has an ability maybe it's actually just a, it can cast confusion maybe that's the easiest way to do this stat blocks don't tell the gm how to run the monster generally they implicitly give you all the information you need to be able to run the monster. And they tell you, for example, that dragons want to fly around because they've got a fly speed and they, they have a breath weapon and they're really good at finding invisible hobbits because they've got really great perception and they can take perception checks as legendary actions. Stat blocks are good at implicitly telling you how to run a monster, but they never explicitly tell you how to run a monster. Last but not least, 
let's just take a quick look at the actions. What am I doing here? Multi-attack. Actually, I don't think this thing should have multi-attacks. I'm not going to bother. I think it should have charge, but I don't think it should have multi-attack. Uh, and I'm going to put gore, which is a melee weapon attack. It's going to be a plus eight to hit, which is actually pretty huge when you think about it with its proficiency bonus and its strength. This is where Home Brewery breaks down a little bit for me in the specifics of how it lays things out. Most of this is correct, but there's a gap between five and feet, which is something to be mindful of. Also, there is a colon after hit. And often it doesn't lay out what type of damage. I think this gore attack should do probably 2d8 plus 4. I might even give it some sort of multi-attack because I do want it, uh, even maybe a weapon like an axe or something. I want it spells to, to kind of be like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Peter Jackson talked about how he didn't want Gandalf to kind of have lightning bolts coming out of his fingertips. He wanted Gandalf to feel, his magic to feel more. Borrow a phrase from Dale, vague and evocative. And that's how I want the chorts magic to feel as well. And, you know, maybe I get rid of spell casting and maybe we've we've covered that it's vague and evocative magic through dark bargain, telepathy, uh, distortion, those sort of abilities. And then when it actually comes to throw down and fight with the chort, generally tries to avoid, then it it uses its, its strength, um, which it has, more so. Actions. As we can see, actions is underlined so that if you want to add bonus actions, again, remembering that semicolon and then adding three hashes and going uh, bonus actions, there needs to be a space between the actions. Dangerous charge. I don't know. We'll call it, we'll give it something. I'm just kind of making that up right now. And then if I want to add legendary actions, I just kind of do the same thing. Of course, with legendary actions, you've got to explain what legendary actions are in every stat block. Uh, as you can see, the stat block itself is also formatted within these kind of purplish areas here, monster frame wide, and then it's got a closing kind of uh, parentheses down the bottom here, which is what's containing it all. If I delete these, it completely breaks the formatting as well. But also if I get rid of wide, it makes it a long stat block instead. Or if I get rid of frame, it gets rid of the frame. So yeah, use Home Brewery. It's a fantastic tool. It's a really great tool for formatting out your stuff to be published on DriveThruRPG or DMs Guild. Or you can use it uh, just in your home game, which is how I use it majoritively. And if you've enjoyed this video, you can check out this one up here to see four dark fantasy monsters that I've designed completely from scratch that you can use in your campaign today. Or you can check out this video where I'm reacting to community creations that they sent us via the Grim Hollow Discord. Both of these videos were made with the assistance of Home Brewery as well, so they kind of dovetail with what we've been talking about here. Check them out.